First of all, you should be patient with my modest and boring English. As a start, I should confess. And secondly, as, as a journalist, uh, I always feel a little bit uh, restless, uncomfortable when I'm on the same platform with academicians and professors, especially from Oxford University or Sabanji. And that's something else. I mean, as, as, as a uh, journalist, I have that kind of feeling that makes me a little bit excited. <laughs> And thirdly, I preferred something, uh, a written piece. I'm going to read it. It's not going to take a long time, only a couple of hours. <laughs> and the, uh, because I talk too slowly, and I read too slowly as well. Thank you. I will talk a little bit about the situation in Turkey. And uh, now I start reading this better. It has never changed when it comes to freedom of expression and press in Turkey, a country that has always had problems in this area. The situation is same old, same old as the Americans say. The freedom of expression had its wings broken in this country during the Cold War and afterwards. Those wings are still broken today. Turkey has tried its hand in multi-party democracy since after the Second World War, but in spite of several achievements, it has not to this day become a first-class democracy. During the Cold War years, violations of freedom of expression mostly had to do with the fear of communism and communist propaganda. That was the major factor that led to imprisonment of writers, journalists, and activists in this country. The articles of criminal code that Turkey adopted from Mussolini's Italy in the 1930s were the Democlean vote that swung over the heads of those who opposed the regime and demanded more democracy. During the Cold War, not only the so-called communist activities, but also the proponents of Sharia, the pretext that certain groups demanded a religious political order in Turkey, led to imprisonment. There was also the so-called Kurdism, an excuse the Turkish state used since the foundation of the Republic to deny a first-class freedom of expression to its citizens. And after the fall of Berlin Wall, the laws of the Cold War era were amended with the good tidings of democracy. But in practice, not much happened. Since the 1990s, the fear of communism has been replaced by the pretext of separatism. Now it is the anti-terror law that suffocates free expression in Turkey, affecting, affecting most negatively Kurdish media. Accusations of terrorism or being a tool of terrorist organization and terrorist propaganda were based on such obscure and open-ended definitions that the, that the range of free expression and free press have been steadily, steadily narrowed. Also, the very low standard of the judges and the prosecutors in Turkey as far as the culture of democracy and supremacy of law are concerned. In other words, the issue of mentality of the judiciary was and still a major obstacle against the freedom of expression in this country. The origins of the structure and mentality that kept Turkey as a second-class democracy go all the way back to the foundation of the republic in 1923 and even further before. The military civilian elite that founded the Republic has always lived with the paranoia that Turkey would become communist or a regime of Sharia were to take hold here 
or Kurds would divide, break up the country. And therefore, that elite, they lived in constant fear, constant fear of democracy. Up until the first decade of 21st century, we had come to describe this system which kept Turkey from becoming a first class democracy and which encompassed an ideological range from Turkish nationalism to racism as military tutelage. Beginning from the early 2000s, under the reign of AK Party, the military tutelage has begun dissolving and weakening, and as a result, the military has started to become subservient to the civilian authority. The range of free expression has been widened when compared to what, what it was in the Cold War era or in the 1990s. But one should not exaggerate that. Yesterday's communism, Shariatism, has been replaced by terrorism as a subtext of separatism. As I have already mentioned, the anti-terror law, as well as the Turkish criminal code and the law on public meetings and demonstration marches, continue to violate the freedom of expression in this country. This situation affects most negatively the Kurdish media and my Kurdish colleagues. Today, there are over a hundred journalists in prison. I am not going to engage in the numeric discussions that the AK Party government has launched in this respect, since I don't find the government's arguments persuasive. What difference would it make if under the so-called criteria of the government spokesman there are 50 journalists in prison rather than 100 or say 30 instead of 50 or 20 instead of 30? And I would like to raise before the conclusion two more points. The current problems facing the freedom of expression and the freedom of press in Turkey do not only result from the laws and the anti-democratic mentality enforcing, enforcing those laws. The political power also casts its long shadow over the media. The AK Party government has a rather interesting pressure mechanism that further narrows the freedom of expression a mechanism that involves the media owners. This means of pressure and control silences the opponent's voice considerably, if not completely. The fact that the newspaper publishers welcome, or at least not resist, the pressure and the inculcation by the centers of power is also detrimental to press freedom in this country. Before I finish, I should also say a few things about the political, historic, and social taboos in Turkey. And that's why the last page. Many institutions, events, and concepts that were deemed untouchable, such as the might of the military or the Kurdish identity, or even the plight of the Armenians in 1915, where the genocide or not subjects are now being discussed with more open and critical view. But the risk of prosecution and the legal framework providing for that is still in place. Furthermore, criticism of Islam and Prophet Muhammad or of Atatürk for that matter, is still a taboo today. I will give you an example. One of my colleagues and a well-known novelist, Ahmed Altan, nowadays has been before court because he wrote Atatürk, the founder of the Republic, was a dictator. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, our final title is supposed to be about limits to free speech and uh, I mean if we take this to
Hmm? Mike. If we take this to constitute some kind of question about whether there might be reasonable limits to uh, free speech, then I'm out of place. Uh, uh, I, have, uh, I have nothing to say uh, in that regard. I cannot think of any way I could bring myself to propose uh, any kind of limits uh, uh, to free speech, including the admittedly very thorny question of hate speech and its linkage to uh, 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 hate crimes. Um, I, uh, uh, not only uh, because of my uh, involvement with the Armenian genocide question over the last uh, dozen years or so, but also more generally because of my, how shall I say, decades of uh, militant experience on the, uh, on the old left. Uh, I have come to be perhaps uh, extremely touchy over this question of uh, 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 free speech. And uh, I find myself uh, uh, perpetually obsessed with uh, debates carried on in my own mind about uh, infringements uh, on, or encroachments uh, on uh, free speech by uh, uh, not just by not just by the state in Turkey, uh, not just by the deep state establishment, whatever you want to call it, or not by the right or by the extreme right, but also examples of uh, 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 how shall I say very deeply. Uh, and racinated encroachments uh, on free speech and freedom of scholarship, etc., in the history of the left, in general, internationally, and in uh, and in Turkey, and uh, I can think of uh, too many examples in which uh, uh, these. Uh, I mean, we've spoken of, uh, and Timothy Garden Ash too has spoken of. Uh, uh, we have all written about perhaps examples of law or politics encroaching upon scholarship, uh, on the, on, upon the uh, sphere of scholarship, and how uh, it is at grave risk to themselves that uh, scholars or academics slip into some kind of pragmatism or utilitarianism in condoning such uh, encroachments uh, uh, in any way. Uh, but uh, I can think of uh, examples of, for example, uh, uh, too powerful, much too powerful state or party leaders in the Soviet Union or China, and not just in Nazi Germany, speaking out on behalf of this or that theory or this or that interpretation, and after the great leader has spoken out, uh, further discussion or further opposition becomes impossible. Uh, uh, Stalin uh, uh, condemning uh, the so-called uh, uh, Asiatic mode of production or oriental despotism uh, uh, theories in the 1920s and 30s in the Leningrad and Tiflis uh, uh, debates. Uh, in the 1950s when uh, China was still, uh, had still had a population less than 500 million, Mao Zedong speaking out against uh, birth control and calling it a form of reactionary Malthusianism uh, and sending off the uh, very respected demographer that was president of uh, the rector of uh, the University of Beijing off to the uh, uh, labor camps. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Atatürk uh, uh, and his close retinue inventing the uh, ludicrously uh, uh, unscientific so-called Turkish thesis of history and the sun theory of language in the 1930s and Turkish history and linguistics uh, then needing something like 40, 50 years to recover and it still had not recovered uh, uh, completely from that, uh, from that trauma. So all my instincts whenever, as a historian, as a scholar, as an academic, uh, whenever the question of free speech and any kind of interference with uh, uh, academic freedom or the scholarly freedom to do research and to give voice to one's opinions, however nefarious these might seem to be, 
uh, uh, to need to be at any given time. Uh, for example, like the uh, uh, Loire uh, uh in France and proposals for its uh, extension to cover the Armenian genocide or any kind of uh, genocide. Uh, uh, I, uh, I cannot see myself in uh, that kind of discussion uh, uh, for the sake of this or that kind of uh, convenience. Uh, uh, condoning in any way some kind of restriction on uh, uh, being imposed on uh, uh, the right of free speech and uh, uh, free academic discussion for any excuse or reason or uh, uh, pretext whatsoever. Um, having said that, having made my position on that uh, uh, very clear, I would like to uh, dwell a bit on uh, not just uh, examples of curtailment of free speech by law in Turkey, but also through informal means of enforcement, uh, as was mentioned at uh, uh, some point. That is to say, behind the law, or uh, uh, non-legal means of enforcement, intellectual terror, psychological terror, intimidation, etc., which is something that we experience all the time. Uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in this country, uh, I would, uh, 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 for obvious reasons, I'd like to draw my examples from the question of the Armenian genocide, because this is an area. This is these you know this is an area of contradictory discourses, which I, <coughs> which I happen to know rather well. Uh, I must confess to something. Uh, I have never had charges brought against me on question of my because of my speaking out on the on the question of the Armenian genocide. Uh, I was asked this question uh, at a seminar at Harvard in early 2007 when I was speaking about again human rights and free speech violations, encroachments, uh, uh, etc. in Turkey. And uh, by way of trying to demonstrate how falsely uh, I was representing the situation in Turkey, uh, a member of the audience got up and challenged me, have you ever been tried uh, yourself for pronouncing something like the Armenian genocide? And I said, no, I haven't. I've never had. In, in, incredibly, in these past... Uh, uh, 12, 13 years when I've been, in fact, saying Armenian genocide all the time. I've never had charges uh, brought against me. And then uh, she said, uh, but doesn't that prove that there is, uh, in fact, uh, comprehensive freedom of speech in Turkey uh, over this question? No, I said, it, it, it isn't exactly that. Uh, I, uh, I had to, of course, uh, respond to the question of why it was that I had never been brought on that I'd never been uh, prosecuted. And I said the best answer that I could give was because of the way, because of the tone of voice or because of the verbalizations through which I had spoken about the historical veracity, the historical truth of uh, uh, Armenian genocide. Uh, for example, I had never accused all Turks in general. I never said anything like, you know, those bastards the Turks did uh, all this. That is to say, I had never used anything remotely resembling the language of militant Armenian nationalism uh, 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 or any kind of turk uh, uh, uh counter-nationalism. Uh, uh, I had always uh, uh, held specific people and a specific political party and a specific leadership responsible for this. I had always spoken of unionist nationalism and the uh, military triumvirate of uh, Enver Talat Jamal and unionist ideology in general. That is to say, I had addressed myself to historical agencies or subjects or targets which could not possibly be generalized as all Turks, uh, 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 an ethnic uh, category uh, per se. And, uh, Involved in my uh, efforts of uh, genocide recognition uh, were also uh, uh, attempts at, how shall I say, 
attempts not at trying to condone, but at trying to understand why and how the uh, Armenian genocide uh, had happened. I hadn't, I hadn't really been trying to safeguard myself in any way. You know, in choosing my words, in choosing my language, I was never uh, trying to adopt uh, measures to make sure that I would not be prosecuted, uh, that no charges would that uh, no charges would be brought against me. It was simply that. With my historian's uh, training as a scholar, that was the language with which I spoke. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, I did not deal with uh, general ethnic categories. I did not deal with uh, any kind of reverse uh, uh, hate speech. In fact, in my mind, I was always constantly trying to address the problem of how do I make myself listened to by the Turkish audience in general. Because the Armenian genocide question is a Turkish question. It began in Turkey, and if it is ever going to be solved, it will have to be solved in the, in the Turkish conscience, uh, uh, if uh, ever there is going to be any coming to uh, terms with it. And therefore, maybe without realizing it, from a very early stage onwards, my, my problem was always, how can I make them listen to? Uh, how can I make my voice heard? How can I be persuasive? How can I, how can I make sure that my voice is not stifled or silenced in the din? Uh, uh, and together with my professional training as, a, as an academic, that uh, had a great deal to do with eventually how, not just a question of what you are saying, <coughs> it is always a question of also how you are saying. Now, of course, that was my response at, uh, at that uh, uh, Harvard seminar uh, uh, five years ago, uh, early in 2007, very soon, in fact, after, uh, after Frant had been uh, murdered. Now, uh, uh, having said that, uh, back to uh, the main question. In Turkey, for example, over the question of the Armenian genocide, what are the multiple uh, mechanisms of a non-legal or extra-legal coercion and intimidation that are brought into play, and what kind of effect, what kind of impact, what kind of very real impact they can have on, on the public, on ordinary people, on more specifically, on the question of real personal social memory as opposed to official national memory. Uh, I may be transgressing on my time limits, but I'll try to say this very quickly. I don't know if we realize it or not, but ostensibly, on the surface, the official position of the Turkish state over what happened in 1915 is not that it did not happen. Not that it is just a pack of imperialist lies or slanders, etc. It is, in fact, that something sad and tragic did happen, but it is not genocide. That is actually the official position. What, what kind of sad or tragic thing happened, they never say. Uh, uh, they stop short of elaborating. That, uh, uh, giving voice to that, <coughs> that. but uh, yes, something very sad happened in those times, but it is not just. Now, then it becomes a matter of explaining why it was not genocide. We accidentally, uh, they died accidentally from too much cold, they died accidentally from too much heat, uh, 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 etc. You name it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, these measures were not intended to ethnically eradicate an entire population group, but they were taken by reason of state, as a state necessity, because they were also doing it to us. That is to say, then you enter a stage of 
uh, Armenian nationalist guerrilla operations behind the eastern frontier, what Armenian nationalist organizations were, dem uh, were demanding, what we might qualify as low intensity, local level ethnic warfare uh, that was taking place in the early 20th century, uh, mutual raids against each other's villages, uh, local level uh, uh, violence, etc., etc. And this gradually reaches a crescendo. Uh, it starts growing and growing so that although you have initially started with something sad and tragic happened, but it was not genocide, without ever realizing how we really got there, the discourse switches to one of forgetting about what the Ottoman state did and enumerating all the crimes that Armenians committed against us. And that aspect of the argument begins to swell and grow into a uh, crescendo so that in the end a it turns out that we were we did not we Turks did not perpetrate genocide or ethnic cleansing or whatever but we were in fact victims rather than uh, uh, oppressors <coughs> furthermore what comes out is the, uh, is the argument uh, that Yes, it happened, but by now it is, the tone of voice has changed com completely. It is not sad and tragic. The tone of voice has, has become vindictive and triumphalist. It was justified patriotic self-defense because if we hadn't resorted to it, the Armenians would have perpetrated yet another stab in the back against us and taken a step further along the way of, uh, of the progressive dismantling of the, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. So the message becomes, although it didn't start like that, the message becomes they deserved what was coming to them. Uh, 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 and, you know, when uh, some, uh, uh, some spokesman of uh, <laughs> Turkish ultranationalism in this regard uh, speak of um, this is just an imperialist fabrication, they don't really mean it did not happen. Uh, they mean it happened and it was justified. But it was very sad and tragic, but it was not genocide. To end in that way, they got what was coming to them. Uh, uh, and it was our way to defend ourselves. Uh, switch from a snarling, sneering, hyena-like kind of admission of uh, uh, tragedy to uh, a full-fledged growl uh, about, uh, by God, we did it and we will, uh, we, we will do it again if, uh, if necessary, kind of uh, uh, outcome. Uh, but what is the impact of, okay, as, as a scholar, I can take this apart. I can notice, I can pinpoint all the intermediate steps and how it gets from there to there. But what is the overall impact on the public? The overall impact on the public, what, what the public remembers, uh, is it did not happen. It's an imperialist fabrication. That becomes the bottom line. And it can have uh, very strange kinds of uh, effects on people and on the clash, it, on the clash between what people are told to believe as official national memory and uh, what they happen to know from personal experience. I will conclude with an anecdote which I have written about uh, once or at, at least once uh, 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 in the press and which I may have related on uh, other occasions. Uh, we were having a class reunion. I'm a graduate of Robert Academy, class of uh, 1964, and in 2004 we were having our 40th class reunion. This was four years after I had come out of the closet, so to speak, uh, over the uh, historical truth of uh, the Armenian genocide by granting that uh, uh, now notorious interview to Neshe Duzel in uh, October 2000. So, uh, I had a certain notoriety at the time, uh, I was being attacked all the time, I was being debated all the time, and here were my old <laughs> classmates from high school wanting to hear all about it. So, I found myself on some kind of lawn in an afternoon cocktail party, 
uh, and uh, uh, immediately, as soon as I arrived, there were 10 or 12 uh, people gathered around me, and mind you, uh, the cream of society, I mean uh, businessmen and bankers and uh, uh, academics, not just in Turkey, but also abroad, <coughs> etc. And one of them rather politely said, Halil, I've been following you, you know, following what you've been uh, writing. Uh, tell me, just did this really happen? <laughs> uh, and I said, okay. I mean, he was, he was and is a professor of economics and finance, not in Turkey but abroad in Europe. So sophisticated intellectual, okay? Sophisticated intellectual and academic. Said, did it really happen? And I said, okay. I'll try to explain. And you know, I. I tried to put everything and my version of what had actually happened into a, a you know, reasonable narrative and they listened to me for about uh, 15 minutes or so. And when I had finished, I dealt, I dealt with things like contradictions in uh, Talat Pasha's telegrams, this, that, etc. I don't want to go into the question of evidence. When I had finished, there was silence. And then this professor of economics and finance, he nodded his head. Yeah. He said, yes, it figures, it fits. You know, I'm from central Anatolia. And my grandfather died when I was 15. And all the time in my childhood, he used to tell us about how they butchered the Armenians. Uh, he was himself a butcher by profession. So one day, uh, his grand he's talking about his grandfather and stories that his grandfather told him when he was small, 10 years old or so. Uh, he'd be sitting on his grandfather's lap and his grandfather would be telling him the, the stories about just what it was that he and his friends had done to the Armenians. On the farm, one day, he had put on his white uh, uh, leather butcher's uh, apron and taken up his position by a feeding trough and all day from early morning until nightfall they had before, brought before him Armenians, the local Armenians with their hands tied behind them and he had pushed their hands down and slit their throats with his butcher's knife. And uh, you know, he'd been, uh, he had done this continuously uh, for, a, <coughs> for a whole day uh, and uh, he said, uh, you know, this person, the grandson who was narrating it to me in the, uh, you know, in the midst of these 15 people uh, uh, around me, uh, he said, uh, 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 you know, my grandfather told me that when evening fell, he was drenched in blood from head to toe. Whereupon silence fell on the group. And then another voice piped up. Uh, an engineer, a mechanical engineer who had been educated in Germany, <laughs> and he said, "Yes, I'm from the from the south, from the Adana region, and uh, uh, in my family, everybody used to speak about how they loaded all the Armenians on trucks with their hands and feet bound in the morning and left with them, and then the trucks came back empty uh, in the evening, and nothing was nothing more was heard of." And then another spoke up, and he said, yes, I'm from central Anatolia too, and uh, what they did in our village was they again bound up the Armenians' hand and feet and took them to the banks of the Halis, the Kızılırmak. And, uh, you know, the stories that we used to hear was that the Halis ran red for many days, and again the trucks and horse carts and carriages came back empty. So three people, three individual testimonies, and, uh, and again, silence. And I said, look, you guys, if these are all part of your family memories and narratives, what do you mean asking me, did this happen? <laughs> and then the first economics professor spoke up again, and he said, but my grandfather also used to say, they started it, they first did it to us. And I said, can that be an explanation, an excuse for saying that a historical event has not happened? And he said, I don't know the answer to that. Now, 
what we have here is in fact a, a very complex demonstration of the multi-layered uh, kind of uh, national, local, family, personal kind of memory that we have. At the bottom, there is a substratum of people's actual experience. What they, what, what they know happened in their childhood, and youth, etc. And there is this enormous cold stone of official ideology pressing on that from above, crushing it, uh, pushing it deeper and deeper underground, and trying to persuade people that this was maybe something in their dreams that it, uh, 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 it never happened. This is the incredibly complex and difficult situation we find ourselves in. And as to, as to cope with it, I have nothing to espouse but just continue, uh, continue talking, continue trying to normalize the uh, conversation. Against all odds, uh, continue to oppose uh, uh, all uh, encroachments upon the right of free speech and just stand by the principle for as long as we need to, which is forever, and just try to do something through it. And I don't think there is any other answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Open forum. So we we're, we'd like you to participate in this. Uh, so it's now open uh, to your comments, questions, <coughs> however you would like to contribute to this debate. Please. Should I like to ask the question, uh, address it to uh, is there, uh, Timothy and Yasin. Uh, in terms of uh, hate speech, uh, when uh, something dangerous, something prejudicial becomes a hate speech, you know. <coughs> you gave all the examples, uh, and uh, for instance, uh, when uh, we used to talk about uh, Timothy, should we refer to or <coughs> Immanuel Wallerstein? Uh, when we talk about uh, Orientalism, uh, the work of Edward Said, uh, we used to actually make a difference between prejudice and Orientalism, and something becomes Orientalist when the prejudice becomes very systematic. Recursive. So, are there ways of uh, differentiating between something that is dangerous, something that is uh, prejudicial, and something becomes uh, it's so rare actually? And uh, in terms of uh, Timothy and Halid, I see some uh, similarity between uh, uh, sort of between you two guys in terms of the, the use of libertarian logic that that you know uh, we have to have uh, you know push the freedom of speech to the larger extent so that we have a freedom of speech. But uh, then you actually start uh, talking about uh, some of your ex own experience, how you actually come up with the idea of uh, <coughs> Armenian genocide without using hate speech, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, the, the, your, your methodology. In terms of uh, yours, actually, when uh, the freedom of speech uh, has a limit, uh, where, where do we put that, that limit that, that we don't actually uh, uh, sort of uh, have a trade-off between libertarianism and... Uh, we have two questions, so I still uh, First, I would like to express myself in writing because maybe I was misunderstood. I do believe in free speech, of course, uh, freedom of the press from the bottom of my heart. Uh, but I also do believe that uh, there must be some limitations. Uh, the European Court of uh, Human Rights uh, famously concluded that free speech extends also to statements which offend, shock, or disturb. We uh, all know. Uh, and some uh, countries maintain, uh, maintain laws that invite uh, conflict between judges and journals. For example, in, instance, in um, France, Loi sur la liberté de la presse, uh, the 
uh, you know, press freedom law prohibits attacks against honor due to ethnicity, nationality, race or origin. This concern is well intentioned, uh, but such provision can be sometimes unfortunately misused to stifle criticism of a religious conviction uh, or practice, even if that criticism is not motivated by hatred and is the expression of sincerely uh, belief. For example, there must be a distinction made between the harmful speech and the speech. I yes. couldn't have the time to give those uh, details. For example, the Orhan Pamuk case, also the Huran Pink's case, uh, public denigration of Turkishness, we had all these problems. Also, this process could be dangerous. It raises the prospect of different uh, states pursuing their own version of his story by demanding <coughs> that writers, journalists, all citizens keep to script uh, that's approved by the government. It opens the way to subjugating freedom of expression to nationalist agendas of all the countries. One more thing, the Strasbourg court has been uh, careful to define a line between a genuine incitement to violence and press freedom. But in times of tension uh, and public anxiety, unfortunately, this is not certain. There is, uh, it could be that. The court ruled in October 2008, for instance, on a case against a French political cartoonist who was convicted in 2002 over a cartoon portraying the 11th September 2001 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in New York. The caption parodied an advertising slogan. We have all dreamed of it. Hamas did it. This was the cartoon. And, uh, but I, uh, uh, according to uh, what um, Professor Khalil Berta said, Yes, I agree, but he was very much lucky, but he also had, I think, uh, a lot of, not self-censorship, self-control, and you didn't use any hate speech, that's why there was no <laughs> uh, problem with you in the low side, I think, because it's, uh, <coughs> you are lucky, quite lucky, I think, <laughs> I must say, yeah. First of all, thank you for extremely rich and fascinating contributions that feed into our work in all sorts of ways. I can already see two texts we want to grab and at least two people we want to interview, so it was wonderful enrichment. Um, your question is, I think, critically important because the question is, what is the causal relationship between hate speech and hate crime, of which the extreme example is people being killed. Uh, if you try to legislate against the totality of hate speech, you're lost, in my view. And there are many, many examples of this, because actually, gradations of dislike hostility up to hate, a part of everyday life. I hate some things too. I hate British anti-electronics. I hate Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of the founding fathers said that there are circumstances in which hate is a healthy emotion. So actually trying to legislate against the whole spectrum of hate speech it becomes a double-edged sword. What's the missing link? We have on the site a very interesting interview with a woman called Susan Benish who says what you need to target is not the whole spectrum of hate speech, but what she calls dangerous speech, mm -hmm. i.e. that mixture of contextual elements where hate speech actually becomes dangerous to life and war. And Pranding is, is a very good example of this. That, that same set of statements given in a different context, a context of a secure democracy without any deep state elements, with less violent extremists, with a strong, open, diverse media, 
of the rule of law would not have had the same effects, or not been likely to have the same effects, right? So let me give you the counter-example, which is a, a place called England. So um, uh, I, I did, uh, without, I hope, too much complacency, so I did a very interesting conversation with the Director General of the BBC, Mark Thompson, who admitted that they wouldn't have broadcast the kind of satire uh, on, the, on, on the Prophet Muhammad that they did broadcast on Jesus Christ, right? They broadcast something called Jerry Springer the Opera, which had a deeply offensive yes. representation of Jesus Christ as a, a sort of grown-up baby in a nappy, and lots of Christians complained. Okay, so Mark Thompson admitted this asymmetry of the treats, actually. Um, the Spectator did a blog which was called, entitled, you've got it up here, Should Christians Kill Mark Thompson? Right? <laughs> now, in a certain context, that's hate speech. Yeah? It's calling on Christians to kill Mark Thompson. Yeah? But we all know it's a joke, because this is England, right? And it's a joke, so it's fine. So it's a, the, the Danger. mixture of elements <coughs> where it becomes exactly. dangerous, which I think is absolutely crucial. And I hope when you're drawing up your legislation here, mm -hmm. you'll have that in mind. If I may just say a word to your second question. I mean, just to applaud the three hands cap clapping everything that Halil Bektai said. I actually think this is a very easy area in terms of legislation, because the answer is there should be none. Yes. There should be no memory laws whatsoever. Leave history to the historians to free historical debate. In other words, it is as wrong that it should be a crime in Switzerland to deny that what happened to the Armenians in 1915 was a genocide, as that you risk prosecution for saying that it was. The clear and logical consequence of this, and I say this emphatically, is that there should be no laws criminalizing Holocaust denial. This is something good European liberals find extremely different, difficult to accept, and my liberal friends in Germany, or Switzerland, or Austria, or even, I'm very, very uncomfortable by it. But it's a clear, logical consequence of this principle, and I say that absolutely clearly because the bane of all free speech debates is double standards. It is a pure double standard to say that that which we hold as sacred, the memory of the Holocaust, should be protected by the law, but other people's sacred powers are a fair game. Yes. Shall we pass this to I'm really shocked. I had some questions, but this knocked me off the chair. Speaking very frankly, I'm a Dutch uh, social scientist, psychologist, and economist. I do political science. I am moving to Istanbul. I've been in Germany, universities, um, when I came here. One of my first experiences was the atmosphere in Turkey, in Istanbul. Most of my friends, colleagues, they are very liberal persons. They are some way related uh, to CHP, left, left liberal. <laughs> and, <laughs> whatever it is means, you translate it into terms. False, false consciousness. False consciousness. <laughs> no, offense, no offense against your friends, but it is a clear cut example of. Uh, False consciousness or illusion of the epoch. <laughs> they cancel themselves. No. There are some anyway, possible. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 <laughs> no, this is possible. What I experienced was that <clears throat> there is really, they have the mental system. There is in their head. They do not talk about these things in public. And they are liberal persons and they are. Uh, scared to do it. And most of them, they tell you. It is a kind of 
a very heavy costume laying on their minds. And I could not understand it. I couldn't understand it. And they, they say, this is not a secular country. The impact of the military and of Islam are so limiting that it is very difficult to breathe here. And that is why we are very cautious to say what we should say. And what I experienced was there is not only this economic pri privatization, there is a mental, a psychological privatization. They go back to their you know, houses, families, and because they, I think they do not believe in real progress anymore. Thank you. Well, I can talk without the microphone. That's right. Let that microphone be mobile. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah. There you are. Actually, we do have a couple more minutes if, uh, if you have any more comments. Uh, not no, sure. Do you have? I do, but let's make a couple okay. more people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other uh, comments or questions? Uh, there's one. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. uh, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Ash. And in your presentation, what I heard was you do not support having laws that regulate freedom of speech or ensure freedom of speech, but we should do this ourselves. We should, in uh, society, make sure that we listen to each other, we respect each other. But I also think that there's a social aspect to this, and we see I see, particularly in so, uh, Turkish society, there are several communities, several camps, several groups in the society who have very rigid worldviews. They are very much polarized, and indeed, these communities, these groups, put a lot of pressure on the individuals, and they don't let people speak their minds and you know, raise their concerns or even criticize their own neighborhood, quote unquote. We haven't talked about this Mahalia Hospital, the pressure that people put on each other a lot. And I don't know, is it at all possible to overcome this uh, pressure that we put on our own members of our own groups, uh, however we define them, if we don't have any help from the state and any help from the legislation and the laws? So don't we really have some sort of a dilemma there? Is it at all possible to change people and their mindsets without uh, preparing some sort of a legal uh, framework for this? Thank you. So that's very helpful because, um, <coughs> so evidently, uh, I was not arguing that there should be no legal limits to free speech. Uh, every civilized society in the history of humankind, every civilized country in the world, has limits to free speech, including the United States, which has a great first country. <coughs> for example, direct incitement to violence. If I say to someone who has a gun, go and kill the guy next door, and there's a probability that he will go and kill the guy next door, that should be illegal and the police should arrive within five minutes, if not sooner. That's everywhere. That's absolutely clear. And actually, a lot of the essential limitations to free speech do come back to violence in various forms, direct or, 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 or indirect. Um, so, so, so that is not the argument, but the argument is that the law should do the minimum necessary to preserve the space in which people can speak freely. Because you see, our principle on violence says we neither make threats of violence, nor accept violence and <coughs> intimidation. There are two sides to the coin, right? Because if you live in an atmosphere where threats of violence are ever present and are acted upon, nobody speaks freely, because they're all afraid. So it's actually a condition for free speech to have limitations on threats to violence. But the argument is that these limits should be as few and as tightly drawn as possible. 
because the more we can work out for ourselves, the more we will be mature, self-governing citizens. That's to say, free speech is not only a prerequisite, prerequisite for self-government, it is a form of self-government. It is how we govern ourselves, both individually and collectively. Could I actually, if I have the, since I have the microphone, the sole microphone, you seem to have none, talk about free speech, um, uh, uh, just uh, pick up a couple of points, if I may, from the contributions, um, which were extremely interesting. And, and just to say this, I mean, first of all, to my good friend, Karen Oakton, and we can continue this discussion in Oxford, between your two caricature positions, the conservative and the liberating from shackles, there is a position I hold, which is that of modern egalitarian liberalism. And I think this is a totally consistent position, and it's key uh, guiding principle is articulated by the great liberal philosopher Ronald Dworkin as that of equal respect and concern to every human being. <coughs> Equal respect and concern. And if you can translate that into the reality in education, in everyday life, in the labor market, you're that. That's what you need. And that is true. Now, that's not just a matter of law, of what's on the statute book. Because there are lots of countries, like most countries in the world, which have absolutely brilliant laws and constitutions, but the everyday experience of the vulnerable and the marginalized, and the weak, and the poor, is something completely different. And this goes to Karen's second point, which is, I don't think you best address those radical inequalities of power uh, actually by extensive hate speech legislation. In my book, and there are many things you've got to do, education, educational opportunity, access to labor markets, there's lots of stuff. But in terms of free speech, the uniquely important area is the thing that Hassan Jamal was talking about. It is representation in the media. The mass media are, have such a power in all our societies. And by representation in the media, I mean two things. Number one, if you live in a diverse society, you see that diversity on your television screen. Right? So if you watched German television until recently, there was one black guy on morning TV who was a sort of curiosity, because he was a kind of German-American Indian. Um, but otherwise, it was basically white people, mainly blonde. I mean, there were some brunettes, I would have to say. There were a few brunettes and, and, and people with black hair. But it was incredibly blonde in the world. It was unbelievable. And that's very unhealthy in a society which actually has lots of diversity. Britain, in this respect, has got a whole lot of So, for example, Channel 4 News on British television now has an economics correspondent called Faisal Islam. Great name. Great name. Okay, I love that. And the beauty of this is Faisal Islam is not there to talk about Islam. He's there to talk about the economy. Stupid. Right? And that's exactly where you want to be. Well, you have this representation of the minorities, but they're talking about, they're just like other people like that. The other side of representation in the media is how people are portrayed in the media. Example, headline in one of the British tabloids, Muslims rob neighbor's house. Just think about that. Muslims rob neighbor's house, right? You don't get a headline saying Christians rob. Neighbor's house, Jews yeah. rob neighbor's house, or Scientologists yeah. rob neighbor's house, Muslims yeah. rob neighbor's house. This is a classic example uh, the way in which minorities are portrayed. Um, I think actually our Council of Europe working group did a lot on this. And the, the way minorities and marginalized people are actually shown in the media, I mean, Muslims in Europe is a classic example, but an even more classic example uh, is the Roma. The Sinti and Roma, by the way, probably the most consistently oppressed ethnic cultural minority across the whole of Europe. Um, the way you get at that is not by some elaborate hate speech legislation, 
Um, it's by doing good journalism, right? It's by doing good journalism, reporting the story. What well, Hassan Jamal has done brilliantly for so many years, reporting the how these minorities became who they are, reporting the reality of their life, representing them properly in the media. So my own view is that you know one of the most important things that we should take away from this is representation in <coughs> open diverse media. And if you can get that right, then the legislation can take a back seat. Maybe just to add some remarks about the misrepresentation and representation of media of minorities, uh, of the LGBTs, Roma society, we, that's a big problem an issue in Turkish media because uh, mainly uh, the media coverage is uh, mostly uh, they misinform, disinform and sometimes they ignore it. They don't, you, don't, you cannot even see these groups uh, in the media. Also, uh, there is another important point I think that self-regulation we are talking about all uh, Europe is talking about this. There was a big discussion last year. I attended to a meeting in UNESCO in Paris. I mean, uh, self-control is very much important, but in Turkey, when you look here, how the self-control mechanism works, it's terrible. I mean, we have a press, press council, which we imitated the British press council. For you. Yeah, for us. Uh, and you are also press complaints. I think Commission is now not working anymore after Rupert Murdoch's uh, hearing scandals, right? Uh, and the ethical codes on the other side, I mean, uh, nobody obeys it and it's just a boomerang effect. So, uh, of course, hate speech legislation is not the uh, cure, remedy for it, maybe, but. Uh, also, the self-control of the media, we have to work on this, which is, uh, I think, a big issue in Turkish media. I think Halil Bertay wants to add something. Uh, one take on um, revolutions in history is that revolutions will not really come out of absolute bottom desperate situations but rather out of situations or settings that are in some, sen in some sense actually improving, but in the process of improvement there arises a contradiction between rising expectations and the slowness of reality to change. Um, I, think, I think with regard to uh, freedom of speech and conscience and <coughs> academic freedom, etc., everything that we are talking about today, this is the situation in Turkey right now. That is to say, uh, I mean, Hassan Jamal modified his verdict at the end of his paper. He started out by, by saying, or what I heard like, nothing has been changing, etc. It's always the same. But of course, at the end, you yourself conceded that an enormous amount of change has in fact uh, uh, taken uh, place. And so the situation is, as intellectuals, as uh, uh, independent uh, liberals or democrats, critical intellectuals, whatever, uh, we have rising expectations and we are frustrated with uh, what seems very frequently like you know, two steps forward, one step back, one step back, one step forward, three steps back, and is exact, and yet another is exact, uh, etc. Against that, sometimes, you know, I also feel extremely frustrated and angry uh, at all the hypocrisy uh, around us. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to tell us something about not being impatient intellectuals. Uh, um, uh, not trying to resort to shortcuts or uh, expediencies or um, uh, anything like that. Uh, over the last uh, 10, 20 years, uh, I have had uh, two favorite uh, 
British historians. Uh, one of them is sitting here. The other is unfortunately dead. He died about two years ago, Tony Judd. Uh, I was, uh, last week I was reading uh, uh, a piece from Tony Judd's last book with Timothy Snyder that he left unfinished. Uh, thinking or rethinking the 20th uh, uh, century. And there is, at one point, of course, Judd being totally paralyzed, Timothy Snyder was asking him questions. It was, uh, you know, it, it takes the form of a very long running dialogue interview. Uh, it's about the role of intellectuals. And um, uh, Judd, uh, ever witty, ever humorous, incredibly humorous, <coughs> nearing death. Uh, uh, said, um, uh, says something like, um, being a good intellectual <coughs> that can make that can make himself herself heard in the public in public space is a bit like seduction. If you try methods that are too direct, you don't succeed. Uh, if you are patient enough to take a long indirect route, uh, your chances of success are, uh, 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 are much greater. And then he goes on to talk about uh, not trying to, uh, you know, not, uh, not trying to say to ourselves, we will make ourselves heard, we will make ourselves heard, etc. But just latching on to a particular issue and keeping at it, and developing the means to universalize it, to mesh and meld it with universal discourse. Not, I mean, elevating it from the level of an isolated thing in itself, kind of uh, 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 local or unique situation, uh, finding the ways and finding the language to elevate it to the level of uh, uh, universality and comparability, and managing to uh, uh, link it up with uh, broader problematics and discourses. And I think over the question of, I mean, the fight for freedom of speech, academic freedom, freedom of conscience in Turkey, etc., I think this is a very important lesson. Social and Any other comments? Okay. Uh, uh, let me just say one last thing, if I may. We've been asking to put out one microphone here, anyway. Um, which is, first of all, to express my appreciation once again to this extraordinary panel, in which I've learned a huge amount. And we will have the video up on the website. We shall steal your texts. We shall come and interview you. Um, and I, I think what you just said about moving from the particular to the general by degrees is particularly relevant in this case. That's to say, as we all know, every country is the center of the world and the most important and interesting place to itself. And, and, and every country is obsessed with its own particular issues. Um, and it really does help to put them into this sort of a comparative context, um, which I think is what we've been trying to do today. The other thing I want to say is that what you have in the age of the internet is two different kinds of authority. You have the old-fashioned power, which is expertise, the professor. Yes, that great endangered species, the professor. The journalist, the professional journalist, um, the professional think tanker. And then you have the so-called wisdom of crowds, the crowdsourcing. Yes, the mass participation. Um, and what we try to do on this website, <coughs> something quite unusual in universities, which is to bring those two together. So you have undoubted expertise, lots of expertise as we had on this panel. But we also invite you, you in this room, you listening and watching, please to come onto the website and to become part of the debate. Because ultimately, we have to agree on the values we want to uphold. They can't simply be dictated ex cathedra from on high. Universal values have to be those on which a large number of people agree. So please do come and join the free speech debate. There are little cards here that will also give you the 
Facebook and Twitter addresses. Um, you've been given the Twitter hashtag, um, so do please come and join the debate, and, and thank you all very much once again. discussed here, you know, the importance of global norms, uh, of course, um, it doesn't uh, make it really unnecessary that uh, there is still a local fight, really, that needs to be fought uh, against these laws that uh, are in front of free speech, all these taboos, you know, protection of uh, uh, other or the negativity or, you know, uh, various other taboos, insulting Turkishness that uh, came up uh, many times in the course of this panel. I actually thought, I, you know, I would end with this little uh, story um, that uh, a couple of months ago, Granting Foundation organized a uh, conference at the Arbuker, uh, and the, the topic of the conference was uh, atrocities uh, that were, were committed against Armenians in the uh, And uh, there was a lot of discussion on that, you know, free discussion, that referred to the role that was played by the state authorities as well as people, really. And while the role of the people uh, you know, was underlined, of course, uh, it was the role of uh, both uh, Turks and Kurds really, that was discussed uh, you know, freely, actually, for two days. Uh, and um, the mayor of Diyarbakir, uh, who was, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, who heard all the papers uh, for two days, uh, uh, and at the end, uh, he gave us a talk. You know, he was also uh, he collaborated with the foundation, actually, in the organization of the conference. Uh, and he ended, uh, you know, his uh, statements by saying, uh, "Trust me," he said. Uh, no one, uh, you know, will uh, bring any charges against any of you for insulting Kurdishness today. He said, uh, uh, which uh, I thought. Uh,